It's been eye-opening for me to come to Turkey with a group of pilgrims to follow in Paul's footsteps and visit these ancient sites. Paul travelled thousands of miles, but we've seen just a tiny fraction of the distances he covered. I think he must have been a marvellous man. We've been sitting in a very comfortable coach for four or five days already on this pilgrimage. And we've done such distances, I don't know how he could have possibly done it by foot or on a donkey or whatever. Oh, it certainly makes things come um, vividly alive to, to stand where he stood and where the early Christians stood. Uh, that's the Ionic Stoa there, uh, where all the processions started. In spite of all these trials and shipwrecks and beatings and all that, he still pressed on towards the goal, uh, towards the prize, and the prize would be eternal life with Jesus. It must have been an incredible journey, fraught with all kinds of dangers, difficulties, problems, hardships along the way, which Paul alludes to in some of his letters. And so my admiration for him has increased as we have uh, traced some of his steps. The account of Paul meeting the Ephesian elders in Miletus uh, is one of the most moving accounts in the New Testament. It's described in Acts chapter 20. We have Paul's speech there. Uh, it's moving because he knows that it's his, going to be his last time with them. He's convinced that he's going up to Jerusalem and then on to pastures new. So it's goodbye to all his seven years of working around the Aegean. And he knows that hardship is awaiting him. He's often going into places where the name of Christ has just never been heard of before. He's going into cities which are full of pagan culture. And he's going there almost single-handedly, determined to bring a new message into that location. Convinced that God has done something for the world in Jesus Christ, which is for all people. I love this part of the terrace because you've got the grandeur of St Paul's back there. But That's right. If I'm right, isn't that St Bride's? That is indeed St Bride's on the Fleet tiny Street. Spire. The tiny spire. As you see, it's got a very distinctive shape. And in the 17th century, a pastry cook who was working on Ludgate Hill opposite the church looked up at the spire and um, got inspired to make a cake for his daughter's wedding and he made it in the shape of the spire. And that's why ever since we've had wedding cakes that have tiered like that, in the same shape as that spire. And of course, uh, a very uh, important wedding took place not far from here. Well, indeed it did. <laughs> Wasn't it a most marvellous day? That, that was really Incredible. showing London at its best. Absolutely. Uh, we're so good at pomp and pageantry in London. Of course, all the buildings lend themselves to this wonderful pageantry. Does the Thames at all have a, a royal connection? It has an incredible royal connection because if you think about it, there are lots of palaces on the river going from Windsor to Whitehall to Westminster Palace to down to Greenwich, Richmond Palace. And of course, the kings and queens would used to progress between their homes in great state in their state barges along the river, which was the safest and the quickest way to go. 
Further upstream, Windsor is now home to the oldest and largest inhabited castle in the world. But for the many visitors to the castle, the real surprise is the magnificent St George's Chapel, and it's the setting for our next piece of music. And the view every tourist comes to London Indeed. to see. There it is, Big Ben, probably the most famous clock in the world. In fact, Big Ben refers only to the great bell of the great clock. Okay. That is the actual bell is called Ben. And it was named after Sir Benjamin Hall, who was the commissioner of works when it was being built. Or possibly, a story I prefer, it was named after Benjamin Quant, who was a heavyweight champion of the time, whose nickname was Big Ben. Oh, really? Indeed. And what about the, the House of Commons well? Well, here it is, the magnificent House of Parliament. Of course, this is new. This was opened in 1852. It's on the site of Edward the Confessor's Palace of Westminster. So it's, in fact, known as the Palace of Westminster, the oldest royal palace in London. And the big square tower, the other side, the Victoria Tower, was the tallest building in the world when it was first really? built. It was extraordinary. And it's got a copy of every single law and record that's been made since the 11th century inside it now. It's a sort of modern Tower of Babel, you could call it. Do you know what? I'm glad I turned up today. <laughs> so am I. <laughs> I always enjoy telling these stories. Uh, it's a great story. It is a great story. The building we see today was designed by Charles Barry after a fire broke out in 1834, destroying almost all of the original Palace of Westminster. One of the few structures to survive was a glorious underground chapel. St Mary Undercroft isn't normally open to the public, but it still holds regular services for MPs, members of the House of Lords and their families. Last year I met Lady Patricia Scotland, who's a worshipper there. What a jewel this place is. It's absolutely beautiful. It's the church right in the heart of Parliament, and it's just a pool of calm and an opportunity to come and pray. I think it's a very special, very special space. And it's really wonderful because you see people that you never imagined would come and go, oh, hello. How do you feel when you're praying here? Um, really touched, actually, because you have a clear understanding that uh, God is in the centre of 
all we're doing. Every time Parliament starts the day, it starts with prayer. Yeah, many people would imagine that, uh, you know, Parliament and God really wouldn't go hand in hand. I think in this space, there is no party. There's just one body, and that's the body of Christ. And being able to acknowledge that we're all part of it, and we are all part of the solution. And there's a great deal we can do by working together. The other place... Patricia Scotland's career reads as a series of firsts. The first black woman to become a QC, the first to become a government minister, and the first female attorney general. Born in Dominica and brought up in East London, she didn't always feel quite so part of the establishment. I was one of ten children and my mother was a very devout Catholic and my father was an equally ardent Methodist. Um, and I think my parents found it quite hard when they first came to um, England because at that stage it wasn't necessarily as welcoming as they thought it would be. Um, and their faith was a very strong part of um, how they got through all of those things. Some public figures um, find it difficult to own up to being a Christian, if you like. Why do you think that is? I think it's because it makes lots of people feel vulnerable and that you could be subject to attack. There's a feeling that more might be expected of you or that if you make decisions, people will challenge them and look at them through the prism of the faith that you purport to have. It's never really been a, an issue for you though, has it? Uh, no, no it hasn't. I think I've never hesitated from giving the credit where cre the things that I've done that aren't so good, I know they're usually down to me. So faith has been very much part of the uh, living, breathing fabric of my life and who I am.